Welcome to World Trumpet Television again. I'm always delighted to come into your homes. Each week we have this great privilege and a blessing of God with the mandate of the kingdom to bring the message of the kingdom to saints and lives all around the world. That's what World Trumpet TV is all about. Well, I'm excited because all of this month, summer times, we've said we have, you know, what we call a guest marathon, and I'm delighted that the next guest I'm going to introduce to you, he's a friend of World Trumpet TV, he's my great friend, a kingdom man of God that the Lord has given such a unique, powerful word of God. I get to see him in different media networks that I invite him because God has given him such a unique word for this culture, this generation to the body of Christ. And his name is Pastor Jesse Bradley. I want to welcome you again to our guests and viewers of Wild Trumpet TV. Welcome today. Mike, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's an honor. And my prayer is that God will encourage and empower people today through our conversation. Because the God of hope is with us. God has not run out of hope in 2024. The infinite hope of Jesus, the indestructible hope of Jesus, it's all centered on his death and resurrection. And God wants to fill his people. So let's receive his hope, fresh hope today. And Mike, thank you for all the work that you do to encourage, to provide for people. You care for people around the world. You're constantly bringing the good news. I know God gives you much strength. There's a lot of diligence in your work. But trust God that as he's transforming lives, you're going to be able to meet everyone that God has used you to touch in heaven. But for now, keep walking by faith, brother. You know, it's exciting that every time we are together on this broadcast, you've been, I guess, many, many times. There is such a fervency of God's love and compassion that he's placed inside of you and you express it when you speak. But I'd like our viewers to get to know you through the bio that I'm holding right now. Pastor Jesse is a former professional soccer goalkeeper. He played in Zimbabwe, Africa, and Scotland and Minnesota as a radio host. He's an author and a speaker, a graduate of Damoth College. You know, he's, he has a curiosity of faith in Jesus. You know, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things that God has blessed him is, is to be able to go in every sphere to extend the love, the love of God. You know, as I've watched him, most, most of you get to see him on Fox News, ABC, everywhere. That's the unique part of, of his extended ministry. He's a pastor, you know, in Auburn, you know, uh, a great state there. And I, I believe he's going to share with us so many experiences of what God's doing. And, but we're glad and blessed of the Lord. Even I've been, we've been seeking after trying to get this time together you know, with him, but the Lord allowed us, you know, for us to be together today. So I want to thank God for you, man of God, for giving us this opportunity to be our guest. And so we're going to dive into it. You know, what is God doing in 2024? We kind of started talking about that before we got on the broadcast, that the battle of Christ needs, you know, right now. It's, uh, it's another year. It's a, an amazing year. But also, God has given you a message to the culture, to the nation, to the battle of Christ. Would you help us bring us to that grace, the way how God has given it, uniquely given it to you? Thank you, Mike. You know, it's tied to my personal story and my relationship with Jesus. It's also tied to understanding the times. And the vision that God has laid on my heart right now is really in four realms. First, individually, our own relationship with God. It starts with your heart. And then second, your home. Don't forsake your home. And Deuteronomy talks about in chapter 6 being intentional and relational in your home. Your home can be just as spiritually vibrant as the church. We need to win the home. And then the third area would be the local churches, the most hope-filled places in our communities. That's God's vision. And then the fourth is that it extends. There's an overflow locally and globally. And there's no limits to what God can do. When we're filled with God's spirit and word, there's going to be an overflow and the nations will be blessed. Our cities, will be transformed. And think about those four spheres, our hearts, our homes, our churches, and our cities, which leads to our countries. And God starts in our heart. Jesus said, out of the heart, the words flow. Our heart and our treasure are linked. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind. And listen, when we put our trust in Jesus, this is not achieved, it's received. I grew up 
not believing in God. I was an atheist. My parents were divorced when I was age seven. And I turned to athletics, academics, and friends. I thought if those three areas of my life were strong, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be fulfilled. And when I arrived at college, I didn't understand why all my goals, I had checked those boxes. It looked like success on the outside. But Mike, there's two stories in our lives, the outside yes. story and the inside story. And on the inside, I was empty. And I took a class. It was an introduction to world religions. I wasn't seeking God. But the professor assigned the Gospel of John. And if you're watching today and you never read the Bible, open up to the Gospel of John and just say this simple prayer. Jesus, I want to know who you are. God, I want to know about this relationship with you. And this is a relationship with God, not rules, religion, and rituals. It's far better than that. And Jesus makes it clear, whoever believes in him, you will have eternal life. You will have your sins forgiven because he died for your sins and he's risen. This is called grace, and it's what set Christianity apart. As I looked at the different religions, grace is an undeserved gift. God already knows us, loves us, and pursues us. And God's the only one who knows you fully and loves you perfectly. In this invitation from Jesus, we all make a decision because love is not forced. God has demonstrated his love for us. There's no greater love than to sacrifice. Jesus' full sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And yes, we need to receive the gift. Receiving is where it starts. And you cannot be a good enough person to make it to heaven. George Barna reports that over half of America thinks we can achieve our way to heaven through good works, being a good person, and then doing enough where God will then love us and welcome us into heaven. That's not what the Bible says, not by works. Yes. And to receive, you have to humble yourself. And so I made that decision the sophomore year in college. It was the best decision of my life. There's been a song on the inside. There's been a joy that's overflowing. And out of my story, I have that passion to share with people who don't know about the hope of God and don't know about Jesus. And that's why I love your network and everything you do, because you're so focused on Jesus. And we're just not going to find anything greater than God's presence, than the Savior of the world. That's our Lord. Pastor Jesse, I get excited every time I hear you share because the heartbeat of God, you know, you know, resonates through the message that God has given you. I, I always say that you want to measure joy, measure it with the expression of the Great Commission. The men and women that carry that fervency of being able to express Jesus to others every single day, always in hell the joy and the peace of God inside of them. It gives them an excitement for them to go out each day and say, you know what, I'm all going to be about the kingdom. And one of the things that excited us about, you know, Trump and TV, and, you know, has always been the heartbeat of God because we live in a time, and you can agree with me because you travel extendedly all over, all over this country and around the world, we live in a time where the enemy almost feels like he wants to cover the entire planet with his darkness and evil and everything. Yet, un, you know, underneath all that deception, Jesus already overcame him. He's trying to have the world believe or think, you know, that, that you know, he's more powerful. No, he ain't no powerful. Jesus overcame. And that's what gives us this life engine of joy. And pastor, I get to see you every single day. Every time I get this opportunity to be with you, you bring this life of Jesus. How can other leaders be able to take the same grace and mantle because some of them maybe they may be worn out they don't see results you know can you share with some of them in this you know how they can really extend this same fervency of the love of God and compassion that it just oozes itself out to others and others get the experience to be invited into the kingdom of God Mike, in John chapter 15, Jesus says over 10 times, the key word is to abide. To abide is to draw near and listen and trust and receive. Yes. We will not bear fruit unless we abide with Jesus. And if you abide with Jesus, Jesus gave the promise, you will bear much fruit. Yes. So our first calling is to receive. Jesus, in Mark, he said to the disciples, he said, first come to me and then be with me. And after that, he sent them out. There's a lot of people who are busy and doing a lot of things, but they're not receiving from God. Every day we need to receive his spirit, his word, his encouragement, his wisdom, his power. We receive first. 
because we can't share what we don't give. And a lot of mission and vision statements, it's all about doing. But I like to say, abide and respond. The abiding is the filling. And God wants to fill us to overflow. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's a God of overflow. And the key is trust. In every relationship, the core is trust. When you trust God, and make that decision. Now you're gonna receive his hope. Hope is a joyful and confident trust. Hope is confidence in God. And there's a hope that's indestructible. The world can't take it away. You're gonna hear a lot of negativity. You need to reject the narrative of hopelessness. Yes, we have reality that we face, facts that we see. Yes, we grieve, and yes, we get tired, we're human. But we have a hope that's greater than our challenges. And this really, really uh, resonated with me and, and changed my life. I was a professional soccer goalkeeper in Africa. I took a prescribed medication to prevent malaria, built up toxic levels in my system. It was a tragedy. My childhood dream was crushed. I was fighting for my life for one year, took yes. 10 years to fully recover. And I like to say, I didn't find hope until I lost it. God will meet you at that low point. He'll meet you in the deepest, darkest valley and you'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You won't stay there. God rebuilt my life, and he gave me new habits to cultivate. I started to memorize the word. Just like Joshua, when it was time to take new territory for God, what did God say? Meditate on my word day and night. Start to memorize scripture. Read the Bible every day. Not just in the word, but the word in me. And I realized I can't have a performance-based identity. My identity is in the grace and presence of Jesus. When it was performance around soccer, it was a roller coaster ride of pride and shame, inflated and deflated. It's a cruel God to have a performance based identity. But we are secure when we know that God loves us. No one can separate us from his love. And began to pour up my heart to God an intentional gratitude, a gritty gratitude, 10 times every day. This is what I'm thankful for. This is what I'm thanking God for. This is what I thank you, Lord, for. And giving thanks, even when you don't feel grateful, even when you don't feel thankful, don't let your feelings lead the way. Instead, faithfulness is our calling and that gratitude. So those habits, I started to cultivate new habits and God started to increase hope and then find people who are full of God's hope because it's caught, not just taught. And it's more about God's presence than the principles. And it really is about abiding with Jesus. Have confidence in God today. The one who's in you, the Holy Spirit, is greater than the one who's in the world. And also, the light is stronger than the darkness. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He's the light of the world with a capital L. And then he says, you are the light of the world. So shine the light. Don't put it under a bowl. And I believe the world is getting bolder about sin, and we need to get bolder about the hope of Jesus. Yes. And let's do that as we rely on God. We're never going to graduate from reliance, Mike. You know, sometimes long-term Christians think, I have it now, I've got experience, look at my resume, I've got knowledge, I've been preaching so long, and they rely less on the Lord. And that's when we dry up. That's when we get discouraged. And God is calling us into that continual reliance. The more you grow in your faith, the deeper you rely on God. And that's a great place to be. Pride blocks prayer. That's not where we want to be. We want to be relying on the Lord. Yes. I'll just share this one story and then uh, back to you, Mike. I went to Torrey Pines, hang gliders in Southern California. Beautiful place. And it looks kind of dangerous, but they train people in one day. And you can be hang gliding over the cliffs, across the ocean. And I asked them, I said, tell me, who dies? The accidents, the tragedies? Is it the beginners and the rookies? And they said, no, the people who die, it's the most experienced ones. Mm. And I said, well, tell me a little more. They said they get overconfident. They get complacent. They just think they can do it all. And there's a parallel in our spiritual life. Sometimes the ones who know the most Bible have been doing ministry the longest get complacent. And they just think, God, I'll take it from here. But every day we need to rely on God. God will guide us. This is the way walk in it. Where God gives a vision, he gives the provision. Where yes. God leads, he will guide with wisdom. His guidance is good. His plan can be trusted. And our first calling is to draw near to God. Our first calling is to abide with Jesus. If your receiver has been broken, drop your pride today and just receive afresh. If you need to return to the Lord today, repentance brings refreshment. 
It's a 180 degree change. You go from sin to the Savior. Just come to Jesus, receive today. God welcomes you home. If you want to recommit your life to the Lord, if you don't know Jesus, make that decision today because Jesus is the one that's going to satisfy your soul and meet your deepest needs. I'm excited that you're able to reinforce that truth in a time today that we live in. And there's no better time for us to be the you know, witnesses you know, of the reason, reason Christ. I can go back to the book of Acts, you know, just right after they were in the upper room. You know, they, he, he made sure that in order for them to be on fire for Jesus, you know, they needed to go to the upper room. And, and that very essence of their commitment and dedication, you saw it with how they reinforced in making sure that nobody had a witness, nobody had the evidence that he had died and rose again. And when they opened their mouth and talked about that name that's above every name, all of us, the Bible said 3,000. Can you imagine the capacity and the anointing and the grace of God that it can be released, that it captures, you know, 3,000 people within, you know, one morning, one morning. The Bible says, they say, we're not drunk. We're just full of the Spirit of God. So what does that tell us is that Jesus, you know, like, you know, Pastor Jesse said, Jesus is still contagious and still powerful. Even though the world is getting bold in its sin, we need to get bolder, bold in our witness of Jesus. Isn't that right, man of God? That's it. And you know, when you think about those numbers you just shared, in California, over the last two years, there's been specific days where over 4,000 were baptized, and then again, over 4,000. I have been seeing that. And then over 12,000. Just remarkable what God's doing. It feels like the book of Acts. We've been taking initiative with hope campaigns online, and we partnered with Global Media Outreach. And during the World Cup, we had a campaign where we saw over 480,000 people put their trust in Jesus. Wow. And I shared my story of playing professional soccer and then the tragedy and how God's restored me. And keep sharing your story, keep sharing your testimony. We just had another Hope Initiative this year. And in this campaign, we saw over 900,000 make decisions to follow Jesus. Wow! I'm telling you, Mike, there's a harvest right now. People are ready for the Lord. And Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that there be more workers. And my prayer is that churches would rise up, that followers of Jesus would not be discouraged and retreat. Do you know there was a moment in Elijah's life after this great victory on Mount Carmel where he was bold for the Lord and God sent fire down. It was a display where everyone could see who the real God is. And the false gods, it was obvious. They didn't have any power. And after this great victory, there was pressure. There was a death threat from Jezebel. And Elijah got discouraged. You know, during the pandemic, a lot of people got discouraged. And he retreated to a cave. And in that cave, he lost perspective. He lost right. his purpose. He lost his passion. Yes. And yet God met him there, not in the earthquake and the fire, but in a gentle voice. And God asked him a question and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? really twofold. What are you doing here in the mm -hmm. cave? And also, what are you doing here on earth? I'm calling you back to myself and I'm calling you back to your purpose. And God said, I have 7,000. I have many already who are going to serve me. Elijah, it's not all about you. So come out of the cave. And Elijah received the nourishment. And then he started to find Elisha and he continued to be faithful again. We all have those moments. We retreat in the cave and God comes to us with a question, we need to receive again from the Lord. You know, this last year, we started JustChooseHope.org, 28 Days of Hope, because it ignites souls to get into God's Word, to return to Jesus. And people spend about seven or eight hours a day on their devices. We said, what if you took 28 minutes a day and just spent time with God, abiding and receiving? So we laid out daily devotions, daily scripture, daily videos, and it's on the website, justchoosehope.org. People can go through that. Church is going through that together. It's made a difference in our church. And God is writing new stories. During the pandemic, of course, there were so many restrictions. And we started drive through prayer. In our parking lot, we opened it up. And people were coming and pouring out their hearts. We prayed together. We knew we had to continue. 
So we had another drive through prayer, and then we added food and other resources, and it started to grow. Then another church in our neighborhood wanted to join us. And it's all about collaboration, not competition. And we started drive through prayer every week. And now it's twice a week on the busiest street in our city. Yeah. Instead of only praying within the church, which we absolutely want to do, we want to be united in prayer in the church. We also extended prayer into our community. And what we're seeing is that so many people are putting their trust in Jesus. Mike, I could tell you story after story from a husband and wife in a major conflict and the husband driving towards the casino, but then pulling into drive through prayer, receiving prayer, and literally a repentance, 180 degree change, instead of trying to numb the pain in the casino, returning to his wife, apologizing and reconciling. To little children, seven years old, pulling in with mom and saying, let's pull in here, and then them putting their trust in Jesus. It's time and time again, and what's happening? People are hungry for Jesus right now. They're searching for hope. And if we go to where people are, that's the beauty of your television network. You're going to where people are. You're meeting them where they are. They're on their phones. You're bringing a real hope. It's an authentic hope. It's a hope full of love and goodness. It's the hope of Jesus. And because it's so good, people are tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, and they're telling their friends. So again, reject the narrative of hopelessness and instead take the next step forward. Do the next right thing. Wake up today, receive hope, and then look around and say, who can I bless? Who can I bless today? And God is going to work in you and through you in amazing ways. So powerful. You know, you could go on and on and on to just, you know, re-extend that, that truth, you know, to the battle of Christ. I, one of the things that I love is that, is that when you meet men of God like you, and, and that grace of God that you carry is very contagious. I get to see you, I mean, uh, different networks invite you on, you know, because God has given you such a unique message that, you know, in some places they could have been able to push, push it away. But this is the places that God is able to bring you into. Share those moments on how God has uniquely positioned you on the national media networks to extend this message of hope and love, because I believe like you believe, Jesus never gave us a hate message. He gave us a love message. And we have to bring that application of love to the, to the culture, to the people we're, we're sent to, you know. And so I get to see that unique grace that he's given you throughout all the interviews. Of course, we're also honored that you're with us. But just share that experience to other leaders who feel like they can only do ministry on this side of town and not being able to take the message right in the center where it's much needed right now. That's so great that you highlight that because Jesus was always full of love and truth. And that's how we want to share. When we pray, the Bible says, pray for opportunities and pray for courage. Now, it's great in terms of the Christian networks. And a lot of people who don't know Jesus watch the Christian networks. You know, I'm so grateful for your network and so many others that are serving faithfully. What I realized and what God convicted me of about five years ago is that not slowing any of that down, but adding and going to where people are who don't know Jesus in secular networks. And it really began with podcasts that weren't Christian podcasts. And I was guest about 100 interviews. And throughout that time, God was teaching me how to tell my story, how to communicate about his hope. And from those podcasts that led to radio and then television interviews, I remember the first time I was on Good Morning America, we had technical difficulties and I was just praying and praying. It was literally seconds before we went live on the air. Yeah. And there's something about three, two, one live. And it's all of America, you know, millions of people. And I was relying on God praying, and then there was that breakthrough, and I was able to share about Jesus. On another Good Morning America interview, it was during Halloween, and I shared that Jesus is greater than death and darkness and the devil and despair. And sharing the hope of Jesus, talking about hope and then also talking about faith. On some shows, the parameters are a little more narrow, and I might talk about God or prayer or relationship with Jesus. On other networks, it's wide open. When I'm on Fox, they encourage me to talk about faith so I can share freely. When it might be NBC, then uh, it's going to look a little different. 
always be full of love, always be full of truth. You know, Tamron Hall and in this show that, you know, she does a tremendous job hosting. They called me and said, can you be here the next morning? I literally took a red eye, no sleep, showed up at ABC. And then you can watch that interview, but we're, we're talking about the hope of God the entire yes. time. I've been surprised how much freedom there is and encouraged that if you're humble, sincere, you share your story, you share what's changed your life, and then you add value. You know, Mike, one thing that's really resonated, and it comes directly from Scripture, and I ended up writing a book about this recently because it travels well to a wide range of, of audiences. I call it the power of the second thought, and it was part of my recovery, and it comes from a couple of Scriptures. The Bible says, whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, Think about these things, Philippians 4, 8. Also, take every thought captive, make it obedient to Christ. Well, the power of the second thought acknowledges that during the day, we have thousands of first thoughts. Our minds are active. Psychologists say it's at least 6,000 thoughts a day. What do you do with all those thoughts that come in that it's not helpful, it's not truthful, it doesn't build you up, it might be selfish, mean, impure, whatever those thoughts are, you make the decision. You're like an air traffic controller deciding which thoughts land. The first step is to recognize your thoughts. Think about what you're thinking about. And then reject, reject the thoughts that are not coming from God. In essence, you're saying, not in my house. If a criminal showed up in your house, if a hope thief came, like those thoughts, you would not open the front door and say, come in, hang out, spend some time on the couch. Can I make you a meal? Stay for the night. But we harbor and entertain those thoughts for hours, and we don't need to. When you remove those thoughts, now you make room for an intentional second thought. And you can choose a scripture, like perfect love casts out fear. Or you can choose a scripture. One of my go-tos was Isaiah 41.10 during my recovery. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you with my strong and righteous right hand. Mike, we're all tempted. Yeah. And Jesus, when he was tempted, quoted scripture. Yeah. Sometimes it's easy to be lazy, kind of sloppy in our thought life. But when we have scripture, we go to scripture, in those moments where we feel discouraged, alone, we feel like there's no hope. One of the lies I battled is that my life would never get better and there's really no hope for my future. Because I was battling with mental health, physical health, and at that low point I started to turn to scripture and God transformed my life. The power of the second thought, you know, as a goalkeeper on the field, keep the ball out of the back of the net. And it's really goalkeeper mode in between my ears. I'm going to keep that first thought that's not from God out of the way so that I can choose an intentional second thought. Second thoughts are usually better than first thoughts. And when your thought life is good, it directs everything you say and do and your actions and your attitude and your relationships. So God wants to renew our mind. He uses scripture. Cultivate that habit. Uh, it's not really a plug for the book, but if you want to go deeper in that, it's called The Power of the Second Thought. And I'm telling you, when you share scripture with people who don't read the Bible, they're reading your life, even if they're not reading the Bible. But when you share the wisdom of God in scripture, they hear it, and inside they respect it, and inside they want more. And when I'm on those programs, I don't always say this chapter and this verse, but I'm constantly quoting scripture. And they receive it very well. And then they say, come back, could you share more? And I'll come back and I'll share more scripture. So. God opens the door. No one can close it. I'm grateful. Every opportunity is his grace. I just want to be faithful, Mike, in all settings. I just want to be faithful each day. That's my North Star in my life. I believe that's our greatest calling is to be faithful to Jesus. Trust him with the results. Keep taking those relationship risks, those gospel risks, and then do it for the glory of Jesus with a pure heart. Amen. Pastor Jesse, as you speak, you remind me that, you know, several, I think was last year, uh, I have a friend of mine who you will be able to meet when you fly back in Dallas one of these fun days to visit us. His name is Dr. Edward Smith, and God uses him all over the country. Very contagious man of God. He just came, you know, last week he just came from, uh, you know, a host, you know, gathering almost 10, 15,000 people, and he's been a witness to those people who gather from all over the country. And, but everywhere he is, a chaplain, he's been to the Ukraine, just spreading the love of God. And the, point, the reason why I bring that last year, we, had, we broke down the statistics 
of our global reach, especially as far as the unreached people groups around the world. We came to North America. We had almost several, you know, millions of people that have not had a witness of Jesus. We went to Africa. We were, we were decoding the entire continent and concentrating in places where they have not had the witness of Jesus shared with them. And we were sharing with the Battle of Christ and our viewers here in the studio that this is the work of the harvest is yet to be done. But Jesus said the laborers are few. Let's pray in, and you just shared about that. Let's pray that the Lord of the harvest will raise up many for such a time as this. North America needs Jesus. Africa needs Jesus. South America needs Jesus. All these places need Jesus. And I get to see men of God like you and Dr. Smith and others who really say, no, no matter what, we're going to step into that very culture and bring this experience and love of God. And they get to see many people give their love to the Lord. For me, that gets me exciting, you know, to just do that pretty much every day. And that's why I'm excited for us to have this type, this, this broadcast, my brother. Amen. Africa is dear to our hearts. You know, I've lived there. And of course, for you, it's so meaningful. When we see more people get involved, the last seven years, people in our church have run either a half marathon or a full marathon. Yes. Why? To raise money, clean water for kids in Africa. I've yes. seen it firsthand. They'll walk so many miles just to arrive at a site where there's some very dirty water, where animals are drinking, and they'll capture just a little bit of water and then have to walk all the way home to bring it to their families. But, you know, through this marathon, $50 means clean water for the rest of the lives yes. of the child and the family. And so we run. I just ran my first marathon. I never thought I would do that. And one of the most special moments was that my son, who was cheering me on, he saw how tired I was after mile 23, and he came next to me and ran the last three miles with me. And cheering me on, praying for me, running, just helping me cross the finish line. Yes. And more people are getting involved and in not only meeting physical needs, but meeting spiritual needs and sending Bibles and caring for people. You know, uh, when you think about people getting involved, I'm encouraged where I live in Seattle. It is the least religious city in America. It's also the saddest city in America. I think there's a correlation there. The second highest dechurched. But God is raising up fresh hope. And there's one middle school student who started handing out Jesus Loves You bracelets this last year and hundreds of bracelets around the school. So instead of the Christians feeling outnumbered or intimidated, now they look around and they're discovering each other. Wait, you follow Jesus? And other people are asking questions. The bracelets lead to conversations. And there's four high school students that started a Jesus Club on their campus. And the room is so full. Next year, there's going to have to be a performing arts center just to hold the group. Why? Because some students took initiative. And in a public school, not before or after school, but during school, they gather together and share their stories. They share encouragement. They share about the hope of Jesus. And it's transforming the school. There's freedom there. There's uh, parents in our church. They have opened up their home every Friday morning for breakfast. And their house is full as every Friday morning with hospitality. You know, hospitality is about how much love you have in your heart. It's not about how big your home is. I learned hospitality and generosity in Africa. I was blown away by the warmth and the love and the gratitude. And yet people had so little materialistically compared to so many Americans. When we open up our homes, we open up incredible opportunities for God's work. And every Friday morning through breakfast, there's a lot of love and relationships built. And I'll mention one other family that has opened their home. You know, our family, we adopted, and I believe that we're all adopted into God's family through Jesus. And this family has opened up their home to over 100 foster children in the foster care system. And then they've adopted many. If we open up our lives to kids, orphans, people in need, there won't be a foster care system needed in America anymore. But take that next step. As you pray, as you seek God, and God's going to show you this is the way walking it. He's going to reveal your name is on it. And I see people stepping up and making a difference across Seattle right now. Mike, I believe that the answer is not merely that the church staff is active 
or that there's a few leaders in churches doing the heavy lifting. God's vision in the scripture is for all of God's people to be filled with his spirit. Amen. We're all in full-time ministry where we live, work, learn, or play. And when we reject cultural Christianity, that there's just a few people doing it, and now we receive biblical Christianity that God wants to empower and encourage we're most alive when we participate. So let's not, Christianity is not a solo sport. It's not a spectator sport. We need to roll up our sleeves and be part of the solution. It's easy to complain and point fingers and be bitter and resentful and all of these things. That's not what God calls us to. We need to rise above that. Uh, there's a scripture that God keeps bringing me back to and it's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. And crows like to attack and peck eagles and try to steal their food. But eagles, when the crows come, they rise up because crows can't handle the altitude. And the crows are limited where the eagles can continue to soar. Eagles don't soar by flapping their wings and trying harder. They harness the power of the wind. God is calling us for such a time as this to harness the power of the Holy Spirit, the fresh wind, to rise above some of the noise and the gossip and the slander, to rise above the crow zone. As we put our trust in the Lord, we're going to soar together. It's time for us to soar. It's time for us to soar. It's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to re be rekindled with the fire of God to take the love of Jesus in every part of our world. I believe that 100%. You know, as we started, you know, the last few minutes, Pastor, you know, we, we've opened up our hearts to the, this invitation, you know, of the truth of the love of God, that he doesn't deny any man, any woman to come in. Those of you who are watching us right now, the invitation is here. You can take this very opportunity and invite him in. You don't have to pay for that. You know, he invites you as you are. I believe that when you take this opportunity, your life will never be the same again. I remember one time I was driving, you know, around town, and I ended up at, uh, you know, one of the malls in our city. For some reason, that was in my direction, Pastor Jesse, for me to head that way. But I was compelled to drive and say, you know what, it's actually 40 miles, 40 mile minutes away from, you know, where I live, only to find out that he needed me to be at a certain place in that mall at the right time to meet someone in that mall and it was a young lady that was standing at the crossroads she you could see that her countenance was so broken and the spirit of god said her go reach out to her right now quickly as i as i come close to her i say how are you doing and she she kind of gave me a little bit you know uh rhythm of her reply it wasn't the best reply and then the spirit of god i could have walked away and say hey um Okay, have a, have a good day, maybe a blessed day. The Spirit of God compelled me, do not move. And you know what I started to speak to her? I said, I see something that's around you that's about to happen. I'm just going to, I use those kind of words. I said, everybody in this mall doesn't know what you're going through. You know, they, they don't even know what's about. When I say those words, she started to cry. Tia started to weep. And so, so you don't know. She said, now she stops me. She said, you don't know that today was the day that I was going to get step out of here and go pick up my daughter, and I was going to go to Oklahoma and commit suicide. And I not obeyed the voice of God to drive out where, from where I was from my home and go random to some place I didn't even know why I was headed there and go in a random mall and then go in that direction, meet somebody as a stranger that's contemplating about this. She could not have had the witness of Jesus. Amen. She could not have been saved. Her life was saved. Her daughter was saved. But she, was about, she said, I'm about to. The moment I said, the entire mall doesn't know how your world is going under right now. There's so many people that are watching us today. You've had the message from the servant of God. And you're at the crossroads and moments of things happening. And this is a divine moment to hear the word of God and make a U-turn. And that happens when God intervenes in any situation that the enemy might want to take advantage of. And I will never forget that moment. And there's so many other moments. And I know, Pastor Jesse, can, you can relate to those moments, you know, like when you're in, you're racing with the, you know, you're, you know, on the bike racing or marathon and every, and you meet 
strange people that talk with you, and the, that's the moment of the ministry of Jesus passing by them. We are living in that time. You don't know who you're sitting next to on the plane, on the, on the football court, at home, or your neighbors. Everybody today is going through something, and might be you that God is about to use, just like God's using uh, Pastor Jesse to extend this message of God's love. It's so powerful, so powerful. Such an inspiring story, Mike, and it made me think of Acts chapter 16 when the jailer was about to take his life. Paul and Silas were singing. They had the hope of God, even though they were in prison, even though they were victims of an injustice. But they led the jailer to Jesus. His entire family was baptized, and the jailer didn't have hope. The jailer needed the hope of Jesus. Needed the hope. That's our greatest need today. As you see different people come to Jesus in the Bible, Nicodemus came at night. Nicodemus had religion, but he wasn't born again. He didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Zacchaeus had a lot of money, and it was crooked. He took advantage of people. He was full of himself, but his money couldn't satisfy his soul. There was a woman in Samaria. She had five different marriages, mm. five divorces. She kept thinking the next man would satisfy her. Marriage would satisfy her. But marriage can't meet our deepest needs, even though it's a great blessing. What do we find out over and over again? Our hearts are restless till we find our rest in thee. Our souls are thirsty. Jesus told the woman, I have living water. And what's interesting, after she received the living water, she went and told everyone in the town. And the disciples, they were reluctant to reach out. Samaritans, they were cautious. They looked down upon Samaritans, sadly, a second rate. But she had the love of Jesus. And when you're filled up, with the living water, when you're filled up with God's hope, you start to see people how God sees people, and you start to love people, and you just want to bring that message of hope. In Mark chapter 5, there's a man with demons, and Jesus drove out this legion of demons. The man was healed and in his right mind, and he said, mm. Jesus, I'll travel with you. And Jesus said, no, start here yes. in your city, in the Decapolis. Start with your family and share with them. So what is our calling? It's to receive hope and give hope. You can't give what you haven't received. If you don't have it, you can't share it. Today, right now, is an opportunity. This is a place, this is a time where you can turn to God. I serve as chaplain for the Seattle Sounders in the MLS, professional soccer here in America. And what I know about athletes, because I play professionally, is that you're always trying to compete present strong, yeah. whether it's playing time you want or your coaches watching, your teammates, the other team, opposing fans are you know, on top of you in terms of their comments, they're heckling you, they're cruel, the press, they're wanting to know what's really going on. You're always trying to present strong. And let me tell you, if your whole life you're just trying to present really strong in image maintenance, but you don't have on the inside that fountain of hope, which is Jesus, you're going to be worn out. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to present well on social media, but the inside story, it's still going to be lacking. The only way in our city, we have many homeless people. The city tries to intervene, only 7% recovery. But we have Seattle Union Gospel Mission, which loves people, meets physical needs, builds relationships, and then shares Jesus 70% restoration. The difference is Jesus. We have nothing greater than we could share with you today than the relationship with Jesus. And if you've never put your trust in the Lord, today's the day of salvation. Don't harden your heart. You just come to Jesus and say, here I am, Lord. I know I've sinned. I know I've rebelled. But today, I want to follow you. I want to receive your gift of eternal life and the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Amen. Thank you that you're risen from the grave. And I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. And I pray in Jesus' name. And if you just made that decision, you've started a relationship that no one can take away. No one can snatch you from God's hand. You have an eternal security. Your sins are forgiven. Why? You're in God's family. Why? You have peace with God. Why? Because Jesus accomplished it on the cross. He overcame death. And because of his promise, it's guaranteed forever. Jesus never breaks his promise. So know today that you are in God's family forever. And then share your story with other people so others can know they can't believe if they don't hear 
and you have good news. It's too good to just keep it to yourself. It is too good not to share it with other people. You know, of all two, three weeks ago, I was ministering at a church, and I, uh, I was sharing about the breakdown on the world systems and cultures and religions and everything, and I know you have a take on, on, on that. And I, sh I, sh I was able to illustrate the emptiness that man has. You know, this emptiness has led him to somehow have a longing and a search in a wrong direction in pursuit of defining what God is or what Jesus is. When you go far, far east, you find people who worship different deities. Part of their search in that is because there's an emptiness that draws them there because they don't have the real truth that leads them to a true living God that we're talking about here today. When you go in some parts of Africa, you find people that have voodoo, worship. You know, they go through witchcraft and all that. Even them, there's an emptiness because they have not found the truth of the true living God. You go to the Middle East, you find people that are dev devout, devoted in their pursuit of their belief system that's right there. They too, there is an emptiness of what they determine or what they define to be God. The whole planet is in search for it. The children of Israel gave us an example of that when J Moses got them out of, uh, of, of Egypt when they reached into the wilderness, a place of emptiness, they also tried to search for what they were defining as an idol worship. So many times people are caught up. And maybe part of your belief system is a little bit altered because you've never had an experience with Jesus Christ. But we have a witness on this broadcast, Pastor Jesse and myself, to present to you in your emptiness, in your pursuit, in everything you're trying, like Paul told the, the men of Corinth and other places, you're searching the unknown God. But man, let me tell you, let me present to you the living God. We are presenting to you the living God that just like the woman at the well that was thirsty, you know, she didn't even know, you know, what our thirsty was for real. But you could see so many dimensions of our character. Jesus revealed exactly what her real thirst was. It was the emptiness of an experience with Jesus. Even today, you can have that opportunity to open your heart. And I believe this is the reason why God has given us the opportunity to have uh, Pastor Jesse to bring this truth to us, wherever you are around the world, to remove that void and that emptiness within you and replace it with a true living God, and you will never thirst again. I believe that, Pastor Jesse. Yes, and knowing who Jesus is, there's nothing more important. Here's a couple of truths to consider. First of all, we're all made in God's image. We're all wonderfully made. We all have the same maker, and life is a gift. We all have that together as a foundation. Now, someone came up to me recently, a man from Myanmar, and said, aren't all religions the same? And I said, there are some commonalities, there's some common ground. For example, in all religions, we say, love your neighbor as yourself. It's important how you treat someone else. There are some commonalities with all religions, but there are also some very important distinctions. And with those differences and distinctions, we have to have intellectual integrity to notice that it's not the same thing and we need to make choices. For example, there can't be a million gods and only one God. There's either one God or there's a million gods. Yeah. And the truth is there's one God. There are not a million gods. Yes. With Jesus, many people will say he's a good teacher. He's a prophet, born of the Virgin Mary. All those are true statements, but he made a very bold statement. He claimed to be God. When anyone claims to be God, C.S. Lewis says they're either lying, they're a lunatic, or they're the Lord. Anyone who's claimed to be the Messiah, many people have throughout history. You only have three options, liar, lunatic, or Lord. Jesus doesn't lie. He's not out of his mind. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you have to make a decision. One thing that stood out to me was the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, then there should be no Christianity. There's it's no. all based on the resurrection. The evidence of the resurrection is compelling. 
Jesus promised it, prophesied it, and then there was over 500 witnesses that changed lives of the disciples, the Apostle Paul's story, and then the willingness to die for their faith. People will not die for a lie if they know it's a lie, but these witnesses saw it firsthand. When you look at the evidence, facts lead to faith, and there's only one who overcame death. Your decision around God is going to cover your eternity. It's your destiny. Where will you put your trust? Where will you put your hope? Your hope is only as strong as the one in whom you trust. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. You cannot merely say he's a good teacher. You have to look at the totality of the evidence. And as you look at the evidence, I encourage you to have an open mind. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The truth will set you free. It wasn't popular in my family. We're kind of like Baskin Robbins 31 flavors. But when I found the truth, I knew I needed to follow Jesus. And it's worth it to follow Jesus. Even if you're in a part of the world right now where people are going to persecute you or beat you up or throw you in jail or even kill you, it's worth it. This life is short, but eternity is real. Heaven is real. Jesus has gone there to prepare a place for us. Don't put your trust in yourself. You can't save yourself. And ultimately, our sin is either on us or it's on Jesus. It doesn't matter what background you grow up with. It matters who you choose to follow. And Jesus is faithful. And so my encouragement today, if you don't know much about Jesus, open up the Gospel of John and read. And as Jesus reveals himself to you, have an open heart because he is the resurrection. No one else, no other religious leader, they're all in the grave, but Jesus is risen. And this is the hope of the world. There's gonna be people in every nation, tongue and tribe in heaven. And through shows like this, the good news spreads to the entire world. And when Jesus is lifted up, he draws people to himself. So today, don't resist the love of Jesus, receive. When you receive, you're going to be full. And that's what God wants, not for us to be empty and discouraged and have despair and confusion. Those things aren't from God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And Jesus doesn't run out. So abide with Jesus and you will bear much fruit. Pastor Jesse, thank you for being such a great blessing for us today and taking time, you know, to bring this wonderful, mighty truth of the kingdom of God to the viewers here at World Trumpet TV. Thank you for giving us that time. You know, as we continue to do, we would love our viewers to get to know, you know, where they can find you. I know you've, we haven't even talked about the, the books that you've written and the vast, you know, opportunity that so many people get to you know, meet you, the church. Can you take some time to share about that and everything? Yes, our church is in the greater Seattle area, Grace Community Church, and our website is graceinauburn.com, graceinauburn.com. We have free resources that we've set up. I encourage you to take the journey, 28 Days of Hope, justchoosehope.org. You're also going to see interviews. You're going to be able to walk through the book of Acts as we have an 84 days that we're launching. And there's so many different resources there. But if you go to justchoosehope.org, that's the place to get started. You can reach out to me there or through social media, Jesse J. Bradley on all different platforms. I'd love to hear from you, hear your story. Let's keep growing in our faith together. Pastor, thank you. Thank you for being part of this wonderful, wonderful broadcast and your support. We look forward to being with you on Water Trumpet TV weekly going forward. You know, we just love that wonderful, unique ministry that God has given you to bring millions and millions of, you know, the lost to the kingdom of God. You know, as we come to the closure of this broadcast, would you take some time to pray, you know, for our viewers and those who are, have the opportunity to accept the Lord as their personal Savior? Absolutely. And know that God gets all the glory, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name because of your love and faithfulness. And I know for Mike and I, our prayer is that Jesus would increase, we decrease. We're so grateful to the Lord, and that's our heart. Let me pray right now for you as we finish our time here together. 
and uh, what God is going to do in your life. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are watching today that we're joined together as one, united. And God, I pray right now that you would fill my brothers and sisters with your hope, your indestructible hope, Jesus. I pray you give them wisdom in their decisions. I pray you bring healing in their bodies and in their relationships. God, let them be peacemakers. Help them to know in each situation how to respond as they abide in you. I pray also, God, that they would spread their wings. You give them opportunities and boldness. God, I pray that it would be the most fruitful years of their lives as they walk by faith, as they take these different relationship and gospel risks. It would be for your glory. God, I pray that you would also bring collaboration, people into their lives that will mentor them, that they can mentor, that will bring out the best in them. And I pray they wouldn't try to do it alone. Bless them as they open your word. Bless them as they're involved in different churches. And I pray, thanking you, God, that there's no limits to what you can do. You do exceedingly above all we think, ask, and imagine. That's who you are. And we're so grateful for your grace. Today is a gift. We want to be uh, make sure we make the most of every opportunity today, God, because we know that today matters. And we thank you for all your promises in Jesus that we are secure in you forever. We give you praise, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor, again. We're blessed. And World Trumpet TV, we're blessed, God, for you. We know that you've been blessed by this wonderful broadcast. We look forward to every day bringing this message of the kingdom to the world. And we bless you. And thank you, Pastor. We look forward to connecting again and appreciate you. We would love to be part of what you're doing in your part of the world sometime soon. But we're so blessed and honored to be with you today. And pray you feel better because now you, God has just opened your voice for us to have this opportunity to hear you. It's a testimony. I had a sore throat today and God just blessed it with clarity of voice. So he answered that prayer. And Mike, I always enjoy spending time with you. Uh, my prayer again is may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him that you may overflow with hope yes. by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Welcome to our Trumpet TV.